My name is Dimitri. I don't know how to use Max. <laughs> um, I work at Twitter. Everybody uses Max at Twitter. Um, right. So uh, this is a, just a short talk about how we use uh, Fig and HBase uh, at Twitter to do our data analytics. Uh, for those of you who have seen Kevin Wheel's presentations on a similar topic, not the same slides. <laughs> He's been shopping them around a bit. Okay, so who am I? Uh, just really briefly, uh, LDL did some genome stuff, uh, save the world, one test uh, It's really important to pronounce the K in that one uh, when you talk to Korea work. Uh, and then I went off to grad school, did a, uh, got a degree in very large information systems, which is actually something you can get a degree in there. Uh, and uh, hung out at Cloudera during the summer, that was cool. And now I work at uh, Twitter, and also a big committer, which is bittersweet for a Jewish boy. What we're going to talk about uh, here is uh, the Hadoop parts of, uh, of the pipeline. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff, obviously, that we do, uh, but I'm not going to cover because it's the Hadoop user group. Uh, so data movement, the use of HBase, the use of PIG, and just a few kind of tips that um, we find uh, interesting uh, and useful <coughs> when, when working with this stuff in production. Stuff that we're not going to cover is Cassandra, uh, also FlogDB, which is our distributed um, social graph store, uh, or Gizzard, which is kind of a middleware for distributed replication, or our use of MemcacheD, or the rest of our NoSQL bingo card. We've almost got it filled out. There's a couple empty spots if we work on it. <laughs> Uh, daily workload of what we see. Uh, so uh, Twitter, you know, one might think 140 characters, not that much data. Uh, we get a lot of those characters, uh, but uh, the, the actual tweets themselves aren't sort of the majority uh, of, of our data. So we have thousands of front-end machines running uh, the servers. They're all writing logs. We serve 3 billion API requests a day. Uh, the ingested data into uh, our Hadoop cluster is around 7 terabytes a day. Um, uh, we run about 20,000 Hadoop jobs. The number is somewhat inflated, actually, because uh, we use also Hadoop to uh, index our LTO files. So for each file, we have to run a Hadoop job. Uh, uh, there's about 55 million tweets uh, per day that we take, and that's only about half a percent of uh, the total data. Okay, so uh, what? where does all this stuff actually come from? Well, we have all these thousands of front-end machines uh, and they write, you know, to databases when people send tweets or follow each other and stuff like that. Um, so that's all structured data, and we have scheduled exports of those. Um, the databases have there's a replication tree, and then we hang out with some of the weaves and pipe the data into Hadoop. And I'll talk about how we do that. And then all of the servers, the front ends, the middleware servers, the various backend services, uh, write logs, um, and they just scribe them straight uh, into HDFS. Uh, we've been, uh, we use Scribe to do that. We've been contributing to Scribe. Um, so that's that's good. Uh, and then we have various other data source imports, right? Um, various interfaces through which uh, we get data that we may need for our uh, analysis. Okay, then uh, as all this data piles into Hadoop, we have some demons that sort of sit there and watch the file system. And uh, when new files show up, they kick off processes like indexing and verifying that uh, all the files are not corrupt. Um, and then once you verify that everything's good, you run some summaries, and those get off other summaries, and eventually all that gets run down. Uh, and when the pig jobs that compute uh, the uh, analytics uh, jobs finish, uh, we have a wrapper that pushes the result into a simple MySQL database from which we actually serve the dashboards uh, and provide other reports. Uh, logs. Uh, we got all kinds of logs. We got HTTP logs. We have W3C logs on Rails. Uh, we have our uh, specific services. We'll write uh, logs in JSON or in protocol buffers. Uh, protocol buffers is something that we really like uh, in the analytics group because we get a schema with them. Uh, and you know, with JSON, you get user underscore ID and user capital ID and all kinds of things. And yeah, that's for not a problem for protocol buffers. But uh, we get both. Uh, so we have loaders for all of that. 
each category, Scribe writes into categories, it's very simple, you just write into a category and you write a message. Uh, and up it goes into the Scribe world. Uh, so each category winds up in its own directory in HDFS uh, that lets us simply partition which you know, services we are analyzing. Everything is L0 compressed. Uh, we index L0, like I mentioned. Uh, we maintain uh, our own version of the Hadoop L0 libraries uh, that's patched uh, with a bunch of work from us and from uh, Quadera. Uh, so uh, you can get it at this URL. Uh, there's some pretty critical bugs in there that we fixed. So if you're going to be using LZO on Hadoop, use that. Uh, we also get tables that we import from our databases. Uh, things like uh, users and the user profiles, the actual tweets, uh, geotags because you can geotag your tweets, uh, various trends, uh, devices that you register. You can register associate a uh, cell phone with your Twitter Twitter account so that you can uh, receive messages. All that kind of stuff that's, that has a standard schema, those in MySQL databases, gets imported. Um, the way it gets imported is uh, by using uh, protocol buffers. We have some data, some uh, code that will look at uh, a SQL uh, table and generate a protocol buffer definition automatically uh, that will match the table. And then given a protocol buffer de definition, we can generate the input formats uh, the output formats, the writables, um, and also we can run uh, jobs that will automatically convert the actual data from uh, the data in the table into a protocol buffer and then write it into Hadoop. Um, so uh, all that code is in a project that uh, we open source called Elephant Bird, which is really just kind of dumping grounds for all Hadoop-related stuff that we do. There are all kinds of things in there. Um, it's pretty active, and we've even gotten people outside of Twitter to uh, contribute some things to it, so uh, check it out. Uh, our ETL, the actual bits that move data around, uh, we have some software called Crane, uh, which is all config-driven, uh, and it all talks protocol buffers. So you tell it, I have a source, which can be HBase, or it can be a table in MySQL, or it can be an HDFS directory, uh, and uh, here's a protocol buffer uh, that corresponds to that source, and then you define some transformations to take uh, that are defined as uh, Java classes. Um, and they implement a simple interface that takes in a protocol buffer and outputs a protocol buffer, you specify which protocol buffers you want. Uh, and they do various transformations, such as uh, doing geocoding to insert uh, you know, geodata given an IP, and uh, you know, filter things out, all, all kinds of stuff like that. Right? So you can just chain those and then define an output and it goes every direction, right? So it goes MySQL to HDFS, HDFS to MySQL, MySQL to HBase, however you want to do it. Uh, and adding more is, again, a simple question of uh, adding, uh, implementing some simple interfaces. Uh, we are thinking about open sourcing it. The main thing that's stopping us is that it has some uh, assumptions about the way uh, you schedule your jobs uh, because you don't want you know, multiple experts running at the same time, the way the log management works. Um, you know, some of that stuff is fairly Twitter specific. Also, for the database stuff, it relies on having certain indexes being in place to uh, make things efficient so that you only get new data. Um, so once we are sure that we have an abstraction that kind of works for people other than us, I uh, would be happy to uh, share that. We like sharing. We're all about public data. So, uh, HBase. We started using HBase fairly recently. Uh, so, a lot of what I'm saying here is kind of not really battle test, but it's more about the lumps we've gotten along, along the ways. Uh, why, why do we want HBase in the first place? Uh, it's because HBase gives us mutability, right? Uh, for logs, we don't use HBase. Logs are events that happened and that's done, right? Uh, However, uh, for things that are like user profiles, people change their login names, their descriptions, um, links, all kinds of stuff, right? So you change the, uh, if you update the record, we can pull it down, uh, but now we have two versions of your profile, right? One today and one from two months ago. Um, so we can just ignore the updates when we do our analytics, and that's not so good because you get bad data and over time it gets worse. Um, we can pull the updates and at read time, sort of read for all history and join on user ID or something and just figure out what the current, uh, or, or what, what it, something was at any given time and what the changes were. 
Um, so that's painful. Uh, we can uh, pull the updates and result in a batch of sort of have a, a job that now and then writes the one true version, right? Uh, but that's also painful. Uh, or we could do the resolution at write them, right? When we pull the updated records, we just write them on top of the records uh, that uh, that were there and before. <coughs> um, and HBase gives us exactly that, right? If your key is user ID and you write into it, um, you have your past versions because you can set in HBase how many versions you want to keep, uh, and you have the current version by definition, which is exactly the behavior. Um, so, getting HBase lets us uh, kind of avoid the fact that in Hadoop. Uh, it's right ones, right? Uh, and as a bonus, we get the various NoSQL things, right? You have a schema, you have you can do point lookups instead of just doing scans. Um, you can do indexing and all that. Okay, so Cassandra, right? We made the big noise about how we use Cassandra to write uh, tweets and store tweets and to read tweets and all that. Uh, and it's true, we do all all those things. Um, so why aren't we using it for this, right? Do we have a, a lot kind of invested into it? Um, roughly, as far as uh, we see it, Cassandra for us is OLTP and HBase is OLAP, right? Um, you can do similar things with both of them, but one is better than the other and different things. Um, with Cassandra, we get sort of the low latency single key reads, right? You, if you just want to look something up really fast, that's what we use Cassandra for, uh, for serving the, the real-time traffic. Um, Age-based scans are much more powerful. Cassandra is just starting to sort of uh, work on that. Uh, and in fact, uh, one of our engineers is a major contributor to that effort. Uh, but uh, age-based uh, is, is much more powerful than Cassandra if you want to do table scans. And uh, when you're doing analytics, that's basically all you do. Right? Um, also, we use Hadoop to do our analytics, and age-based sits on top of it. So. You get everything collocated. You don't have to move everything there on your network and uh, saturate your routers, and then have your ops people get really mad at you. So that's a bonus. Um, a little bit about how our schema is, uh, works right now for uh, for the tables. Um, so originally we thought, well, we want to be able to sort of uh, get things by date, uh, so you get. Uh, all the events that happened in January, um, and uh, in, you know, generally we want to do a full table scan, right? So our key is going to be a concatenation of the created at uh, field, the date, the thing that created or timestamp, uh, and the ID for whatever table we're pulling, um, and then there's two column families. Uh, so one column family is a protobuf, which contains a serialized version of the whole data. Right, which is uh, nice and compact. Uh, and then uh, if you want to be able to sort of look things up uh, or filter things out at HBase side, uh, you can pull out a few specific columns that you want to be able to index on um, and uh, put them into a different column family called columns, uh, which works pretty well. You can index, that's great. You can filter, that's also great. Uh, all of that is config driven. We just specify you know, which columns to pull out and which not works, um, but there's a problem, right, which uh, I've been talking long enough that you probably figured out like five minutes ago. Uh, so it's easy to query by the created at range, which is nice, uh, but HBase stores keys consecutively, so if you look for things that all happen on the same day, you wind up hitting a single server, uh, which is not great for parallelism. Um, and it's also hard to pull out specific users if you do want to do sort of a point query because you need to do a full table scan of the whole thing, all of our users just to find one ID, uh, which is not great. Uh, also, when you're writing, if uh, your keys begin with the date, then as you're writing new records, you're always appending to the table, so you're always writing into a single um, right? So, well, maybe we'll put the created at into one of those columns that we can index, and we'll uh, just use user ID as key. Well, trouble with user ID being key is that uh, they're right now monotonically increasing, right? Because they're uh, auto incremented in MySQL. So you actually wind up with the same exact problem because the high bits are the same. Uh, so flip the ID, uh, still pretty easy to query, uh, but now you have the bottom bits that are random at the top, uh, so you get distribution <coughs> across the cluster. Uh, 
Um, and then uh, we create a new column family called time to do date range queries. Uh, and we specify a different uh, value for the number of versions to keep so that we can know all the times that record got changed even if we don't necessarily keep all of the history. So that seems to be working pretty well. Um, still subject to change, this is something we're experimenting with. Pig. Uh, you heard a bit about Pig. Uh, Pig's great. Uh, Pig is uh, really fast to write queries in. Um, we write a lot of them uh, every day. Uh, it's pretty pretty quick to learn, we, we found. Uh, it's intuitive for programmers uh, to do the sort of step-by-step -step, uh, process the, that that pig forces you into, as opposed to doing SQL. Um, I did SQL for a long time, uh, and uh, it's great for simple queries, but once you get complex, you get into these amazing, you know, fifth, once a query gets more than like 20 lines, nobody can actually read it, right? You only read parts of it, and then you kind of remember the other parts. Uh, so, uh, so for complex stuff, we much prefer being able to sort of break a problem down and to compute this section and compute that section, and maybe even get some abstraction of um, splitting things out uh, into reusable chunks. Um, we also like it because it's trivial to write PDFs and it's pretty simple to write loaders. It's a lot simpler to write loaders in the in uh, PIG 7, uh, but as is, we wrote uh, quite a few. For example, we wrote uh, loaders for LZO compressed particle buffers and uh, f we recently rewrote the H base loader. Uh, both of those are in Elephant Bird. Um, so, like I said, we recently rewrote the h base loader that uh, came with Pig. Uh, Pig has actually had one for a long time, but uh, I think it wasn't very widely used. Um, it had some problems, uh, so we added a bunch of things. Uh, data can now be binary, so if you're writing an int, it's not a string representation in an int that has to live in h base. It's an int, um, or int writable, or whatever h uses. It's the bytes that int serializes in. Um, we can uh, push down uh, key range filters. So you can say that give me all the keys between A and B and it will do that H base side instead of like before where it will pull all the data over and then you would have to filter it. Uh, you can specify your row caching. Uh, you can uh, optionally load the key so you can decide whether your key is something meaningful and load it in as a, as a column. Uh, you can limit how many rows you're pulling per region which is really nice when you're uh, debugging or just want to get some sampling going. Um, it reports progress, which is actually something HBase doesn't do when it does a scan, uh, so that's cool. Um, and uh, the reporting progress is actually really nice because you get uh, you don't get as many speculative tasks kicking off, and you don't time out your jobs. They're just, as far as Hadoop is concerned, just sitting there doing nothing. Uh, we haven't observed any significant overhead versus HBase. Uh, in fact, uh, at least once, I managed to run faster because uh, because of the speculative testing, um, but you know don't hold me to that. I can't guarantee it will be faster than the thing we're running on. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, it's at least on par. Uh, and uh, I have an example here of what it looks like. It's pretty reasonable. Um, pretty simple to do. Right? Uh, we have a bunch of to-dos that we want to get to once we move uh, to PIG 7, uh, like pu pushing down filters. PIG now provides uh, the ability for you to write a loader that you can take uh, uh, filters that you write in your PIG script. So if you, can pick, if you say load some stuff and then filter by each, that's not funny. Uh, PIG will offer the loader the opportunity to discard things that are less than 20. Uh, if it knows how to do that efficiently without actually passing the data out or maybe without even reading it off disk. Um, uh, so we also want to expose timestamp controls and versions and hence to use indexes and all that kind of stuff. And also storage, which was near impossible to write before. And um, there's a version of the HBase uh, storage that actually already exists somewhere in the GR. Uh, but we need to merge it with, with our changes. Uh, so that will be kind of awesome. Okay, uh, so Elephant Bird. Elephant Bird is on GitHub. Feel free to fork uh, and uh, contribute patches. Uh, it gives you a bunch of stuff. There's some PDFs. 
there's the HBase loader, there's all the SAO and Protobuf stuff. Um, we're working on uh, some things to convert Thrift into tuples and pack. Uh, so you can deserialize uh, Thrift objects as well as Protobuf objects. It kind of works right now unless you have a lot of fields that are null because Thrift doesn't write anything when you have a null field, which makes it hard to introspect. Uh, so I, we're going to rewrite that bit. Uh, but it, for simple things, it already works, so play with it. Uh, so that's cool. Uh, just some tips for if you're using any of these components uh, that we find useful. Uh, first off, bad records are really, really, really bad. Uh, so uh, there's a tendency to sort of, in, if there's an exception, you know, print the stack trace and exit. Um, you don't want to do that if you've been processing for 10 hours. Uh, people get mad. So uh, catch the exception, increment a counter, and return null. Right? And I've been trying to go through the UDFs that are in, in pig and make sure that they all do that. I think, I think we've got most of them at this point. Um, but if you're writing your own, do that. Um, because you never know what kind of crazy exception you're going to catch. It's easier to throw out a record out of a billion than to stop all your processing. And just filter out null clear. Um, so you can see, uh, this is what our JSON loader does, right? There's uh, 15 lines that it couldn't parse a number. There's 153,000 lines that were just somehow badly encoded. But, you know, 95 million were fine, so we're cool with that. Uh, runaway UDFs. This is, a, this is a fun one, right? So you run a regular expression on a few billion tweets that says, that says something like, pull out all the links that are in the string, which seems fairly straightforward. Well, eight people out of those billion have figured out how to make that regular expression loop onto itself, right? Uh, regular expressions will do that, right? They're, uh, they're automatons, they do crazy things. Uh, so, in most cases, it takes a few milliseconds to process a regular expression like that. Sometimes it takes more than five minutes, and then Hadoop says, uh, this task is done and kills it. And then it tries it again and kills it again. Uh, so what we did was we actually wrote an abstract uh, EDF function called monitor EDF, which implements an, an interface. Well, what it does is it spawns off a separate thread uh, that watches your execution and optionally times it out and kills it and returns a default value inside a UDF. So yes, it does do that and spin up a thread for every tuple you process. And no, there isn't a lot of overhead. It's actually really minimal. Um, and it's been working incredibly great. We went from jobs that really couldn't finish and unless we uh, did some crazy things like identify those exact records out of the two billion, throw them out and process again, and then find a few more that did that and do it again, uh, to just sort of having that finish normally. Uh, so that's great. Um, and uh, we plan to attribute the EDF to pick definitely. Um, and we may want to add it to pick internal so it just does that if you annotate your function. If you annotate your eval function, it's like monitor this and return null if it fails. Um, so uh, that's really handy. Use counters. Okay, that, that is something I pulled from Kevin's slides. <coughs> Got it. Uh, not the slide, just the clip art. <laughs> so uh, use the counters. Uh, count everything because uh, uh, you know they're free, uh, so might as well count how many times you invoke the UDF, how many records you parsed, how many records you didn't manage to parse, how many you threw out, how many you tagged out because somebody wrote a crazy, crazy, crazy tweet, uh, and then you can, uh, if you're writing straight uh, MapReduce, you can hook into the cleanup phases and sort of write uh, all the counters and. Uh, in some sort of a format that's, you know, better than what it gives you, um, so that you can do analysis later. Uh, we don't have that in Pig yet, but uh, as Alan was saying, there's some hooks for you to be able to do that, um, and there's some cool metadata that Pig writes in 08 uh, to job clumps that allows you to sort of correlate all the jobs together uh, that correspond to a single script, so you can know that this given script, you know, involves a total of so many PDF parsers and so on. Uh, so that's all coming. And uh, really useful in cases out of some situations where uh, they're really hard time with others. 
uh, lazy deserialization is kind of awesome. Uh, protocol buffers, when uh, we were here last couple months ago, we were deserializing them, and they were great. Um, and we deserialized them by sort of walking the protocol buffer and taking each field and writing into a corresponding field in a tuple. Uh, what we recently did was uh, create a proto tuple, uh, which is just a wrapper that implements the, that extends tuple, but actually internally serves out of a protocol buffer. Uh, it doesn't actually bother creating a pick tuple unless you ask for the specific fields. So it slowly populates the specific fields that you ask for and doesn't touch the rest. Um, and we find that it's a huge performance boost. For a fable that had something like 80 columns um, uh, on a you know, hypothetical sample, it actually runs 30 times faster when you only pulled one field out. For an actual real life example, uh, the screenshot is uh, the Hadoop uh, web interface that we all know and love. And you can see that one task is just blazingly so much faster than the rest. Most of them are at like six or eight percent and this one is halfway done. Uh, and that's the one where that particular node had the jar with the lazy deserialization. That was the only difference. Um, so uh, whether or not you use protocol buffers, if you're using any sort of deserialization, be lazy. Uh, and if you're interested in those things that I said I'm not going to talk about, there's some links. So when these slides get posted, you'll get links to the other stuff. We do all kinds of crazy, nasty, cool things. And they're awesome. Then, <coughs> questions? If Crane is open source, will it appear on Elephant Bird or somewhere else? Uh, it'll probably appear on Kevin Will's GitHub account. Uh, it's kind of self-contained enough that it could just use OpenBird as a dependency and be its own thing. What do you use for a geocoder? Like, is it built in, or you use a server? No, I mean, for that particular one, I think we just use MaxMind. Uh, and, uh, but we have our own, I mean, we acquired a geo company, so we have some of our own stuff, too. This is just for kind of rough and ready. <clears throat> no more questions. All right.